Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where today I'm super fucking excited to finally give you the first of many episodes. Are you fucking with me? This motherfucker. With Andrew Woodset of Heavy Board. A great podcast. If you haven't been listening to it yet, go give it a listen with your ear holes. I want to let everybody know, because it happened today during the live stream. If you haven't heard, Bunny Wild is the Blood Rag Poet of the Year. And Bunny is going to have her own Blood Rag issue, specially just for Bunny, that goes out with every order over the next year. It's fucking amazing. And um, as soon as I get that, that will happen. If you order something today and there's no bunny thing in it, you're like, what the fuck? Um, bunny has to still put it together. So um, we, we already talked and I'm trying to get her to rush this thing together because you know, everything's better when you don't take time on it. This week saw the release of the Bloodshed Review issue two with Mindy Simmonson and Bunny Wild and Rich Boucher, who was actually the runner-up for Blood Rag Poet of the Year. It's pretty fucking awesome. And then plus you get Mindy's awesome center section chapbook, Skeletons, that is fucking great. And it's on some see-through vellum paper, which is just chef's kiss, which there will be a lot of in this episode. So yeah, and Blood Rag, issue 13, first anniversary edition. Pick it up now, Project Broadside. Pick it up now. There's not a lot of copies of that, so get it while the getting's good. The only other thing I want to say here in the preamble, I posted a video this week among all of my great writing tip videos and among all of the great me reading poems from all of the shortlisted poets. I put up a video, and I will link it in the description below, that is called How to Start a Small Press or how to start your own book publishing company, something like that. And I'm using Poetic Anarchy Press as the example. And in that video, I go over the Poetic Anarchy Press submission guidelines and how we are going to not only put people out, but we are going to build poets up. And it's kind of, it shows how the submission process goes, but it also shows our marketing process and why we're doing the things we're doing in the hopes of building up your legacy as a poet, okay? So if you are curious, or even if you wanna start your own press and you wanna know how we're doing it, links down below, watch the video, have a gander at that. So without any further papoo, here is Andrew. Thanks for having me on, man. It's great to meet you, even uh, yeah, 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 screen. yeah. No, dude, like I've been um, like kind of power listening to like a bunch of the fucking episodes and shit. <laughs> nice. So nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard to uh, I don't know, like find people talking about literature, mainly poetry, in a sense where they're not worried about what the fuck people are gonna say about it you know like you uh, guys just i mean i haven't really got to the episodes where it's just you yet um i'm still like powering through but uh but yeah like there's just a like zero fucks given and that's rare so i appreciate it i appreciate you noticing you're actually like the second person to tell me at least somebody that listened and like reached out that was yeah. like I love that you're blending this kind of, you know, academic style with this kind of, yeah, fuck it, you know, like, uh, more accessible is what one person said to me, like outside of the academy. And I'm like, yeah, because it is kind of this weird dividing line where for some reason, there's either the academy or like not the academy. And we're like, so why, you know, yeah. fuck that, like, that's a made up, you know, like, it's not real, like, for real. So yeah. wh what do you do? Like right now? Like, what's your, what's your thing? Uh, I'm a teacher. That's based. I teach. I adjunct teacher at uh, the community college here in uh, Vegas. Nice. And did you go to school in Baltimore? Uh, I'm from Baltimore originally. I did. I went to undergrad in Baltimore and then a grad school in Louisiana. And nice. then I came out here after that and been here since. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Matthew Buckley Smith, who does Slee Ricketts, he went to um, John Hopkins and stuff. So when you started talking about Baltimore and talking about the fucking mountain yeah. goats, I was like, 
oh shit like <laughs> they're like in the same fucking bubble dude <laughs> like um yeah in fact uh poetry says with alice allen she recently just did a whole episode on the mountain goats and um like the john darnelli uh yeah 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 uh, yeah, yeah. I was just like, I, I personally don't like him because the dude sounds like he's fucking whining and shit, and I can't, yeah, I can't get into it. But a lot of people fucking dig him, dude. So I was just like, oh, okay, that's cool. I saw yeah. them live once. It's a very weird crowd. If you go to this, you know, like some of those weird punk shows where there's like a lot of different people. Like, oh yeah skinheads or something and then like just like the ska crowd and then yeah. you know and they all blend together it's kind of a weird pit and shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that was one of the weirdest shows i'd ever been to oh, whereas like these like dude. heroin addicts like a part like part of it that like love the mountain goats and then there were like these kind of indie rock people and then like the punk people and like yeah. very weird crowd nobody knew how to like interact with each other and like uh, <laughs> oh, and they and then from what I can tell, they hate the fact that, you know, this year is like their biggest song and shit. And like, they save that for last <laughs> every single time. Just cause yeah. Oh my God. It's a weird fucking guy. John Darnelli, but Hopkins. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't get into Hopkins. <laughs> they would not accept me to their uh, MFA or graduate programs. Oh no. Yeah. I, I was, I, I mean, I was a shitty student, you know, I was a, not a good student for most yeah. of my life. <laughs> yeah. I, I went to, uh, community college off and on for three years and then just said fuck it in LA are you from LA in LA um I'm from Southern California I grew up in um Orange County like as oh. a child and then Orange County um, boy oh yeah dude you know me it was it was fucking North County it wasn't like it was <laughs> fucking cool or anything like that um I was like uh like what 10 minutes from Compton so it was like yeah. I, I wasn't like um a cool South County boy, but I was born in Anaheim, you know, the whole fucking deal. Ooh, the real California. Anaheim. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Dude. <laughs> I started, I, I was in a punk band and that was Hell great. Yeah. And then I started making movies. And so I was working in LA a lot and going back and forth from Orange County to LA, like, even though it's literally like 17 minutes, it would be like a two and a half hour drive each way. And I'm just like, fuck this. I can't do this anymore. So, moved to LA was in LA for um years and years and then lost my shit moved to Big Bear to be up in the mountains to get away from everyone hated that because of the snow so I then I moved <laughs> to the desert to do an off-grid homestead and did that for two years and then I'm like I but I did it during COVID so that was like the best time to do it but then I just came back to LA I couldn't handle it so yeah I'm I'm a community college grad myself like I uh I went to a four-year school right out of high school, mm-hmm. you know, did nothing but party, dropped out, you know, uh, after two years, got barely any credits because I wasn't going to classes, you know, just partying, doing drugs, drinking and shit, trying yeah, to yeah, fuck. Yeah. And then it's like, after that, I went to a community college and like you, I, I've spent a couple more time than you should <laughs> at a community college, you know, yeah. and uh, ended up actually meeting my my co-host or my former co-host there. Uh, we met in, you know, poetry workshop class. And then it was kind of, okay, transfer into the four year. And then I had a kind of a really unorthodox college experience. Like I said, there's no way Hopkins or a place like that was accepting me in my resume. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah. And I love your, your, uh, yeah, the punk style, man. I got a history, you know, being 13, listening to some of those punk records, you know, life changing, you know. Totally. So I love the attitude. Love what you're doing. Again, thanks for for having me on, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just a little hungover and, uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> had a rough morning and I was trying to put together this week's podcast editing it and I have been publishing my own shit for years and I just started publishing other people and like kind of starting a press and everything like that the actual work I have to do isn't that hard but it's keeping up with orders making sure shit right. gets delivered on time I can't make something if I don't have the product here, like all this like fucking businessy shit. I don't know. Like I'm having to do cost analysis reports now and I want to kill myself. So I'm just like my brains in a million fucking different goddamn. It's weird how that works. Like this is the world now, right? Like even the writing world, even if you did get into a place like Hopkins or a prestigious place that, you know, Iowa, right. That's the one everyone talks about because you will, you'll get a career out of that. If you go Mm -hmm. to Iowa, 
even then you have to do this kind of DIY kind of start your own business like around yourself and then just yeah. kind of learn all this business shit that we none of us went to school for <laughs> you know yeah, we were art real. people well that's uh, why and, I yeah. like when I've talked to people in like especially MFA programs like my biggest fucking thing I'm like if they're not teaching you business along with that like what the fuck is it for because like right. everyone I talk to when they come out of an MFA program, they're like, yeah. And then I just didn't know what to do. And then it was like, uh, I try to get a teaching gig somewhere or something. You know, I still send my books out for contests, but I don't really know what to do. I just, I feel like that's a huge flaw. Um, like if you're paying that much money and putting that much time into becoming something like that, like, the, I, I don't know, not necessarily hand holding but like just for fuck's sake like right what the fuck do you do after this now like i don't know yeah. how was your experience did you get kind of hands on with that uh you know i believed in the fantasy up until maybe my last year of grad school where you know you go to get your mfa and then you'll get a publishing deal and then you every the rest is history right you know it's like this mm -hmm. fantasy and the mfa is kind of sell you that fantasy too uh so yeah, my experience was exactly the same. I know all my friends that were in this, I have friends that are still, you know, doing the PhD route. So went from the yeah. MFA and the kind of the, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a scam, but it is kind of like a redundant credential because the MFA was a terminal degree until they decided it wasn't anymore. And now mm -hmm. you can get a PhD in creative writing, you know, which is basically a literature PhD without the thesis, just, you know, creative thesis, uh, but you know, uh, you ever you know Lee Stein or heard of her? And uh, I, I, I love so. I follow her on Twitter. Twitter is usually where I hang out if I'm on social media. But it's like she has this interesting uh, separation between the industries where she says there's a difference between the creative writing industry and the publishing industry, yeah. and the two are not necessarily equal. You know, they they overlap in places, but they aren't the same thing. No. Whereas like the creative writing industry is based around people who want to be writers like us, people that want to are willing to pay to get lessons or go to school or, you know, a mentor of some kind. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And then the publishing industry, their job is to sell books, although not so much anymore. They're not doing a great <laughs> job at that, but it's like, that was, you know, all they care about is selling books. They don't really necessarily care about, you know, the art of it, the art of it or anything like that. Yeah. Whereas the MFA, they do, you know, so there's positive and negatives to both. Like I, I, I shit on MFAs a lot. It's fun. You know, everybody <laughs> wants a lot of fun, but uh, they do serve a purpose, you know, like they do. Yeah. I would not be as good of a writer, at least I like to think, uh, if I didn't go there to an MFA for three years and have like a mentor rigorously like down my shoulder going, no, no, you know, do it this way, do it better kind of thing. Uh, who was your mentor? Uh, my mentor in graduate school was uh, Amy Fleury, the poet. Um, that? Oh, she's fantastic. She's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, and then in undergrad, I had a great mentor, uh, Leslie Harrison, who I just chanced into uh, getting through, uh, you know, being a transfer student from a community college Yeah. and changed my life. Yeah. Like she was very rigorous, both of them, you know. So undergrad and MFA were in Louisiana. Uh, no, undergrad, I was still in Baltimore at the okay. time. I went to um, uh, Towson University, it's called. Kind of like right on the outskirts of Baltimore City there. Mm -hmm. And um, in Louisiana, where did you go? Uh, McNeese. McNeese Where's that at? Uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. About three hours west of New Orleans. It's like in the boot heel of Louisiana. Okay. Yeah. Like 20 minutes to the Texas border. Uh, heart of Cajun country, very small city. It was a huge culture shock being a kind of a city boy going yeah. to like backwoods. It wasn't even backwoods. It was like a city, but much smaller than where I grew up and yeah. way smaller than like LA or something or Orange County, even the suburbs. Like I love suburbs, but yeah. you know, they don't even exist in places like that. It's just small towns. And, but and it's great. I mean, formative experience to be there. You know? Yeah, for real. Like I, I honestly think being in different places all the time like really shape who you become you know like if you were just in the same place your whole fucking life like you don't really get a whole lot of experience but it changed uh, me forever like yeah. i literally when i moved there 
I was one person. And then three years later, when I moved away, I was a completely different, you know, person, which, you know, is growth, you hope, right? At least yeah, you didn't take a real. turn for the worse. But <laughs> when uh, I left there, I was in handcuffs. Yeah, yeah, I was a total asshole. Nobody <laughs> liked me. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it did, you know, being in such a culture shock, such an isolated part of the country. And like, at first, you know, I was very shocked and rejected the culture of kind of the Cajun, you know, hunting, mm -hmm. fishing all the time, you know, Southern Louisiana, you know, yeah. like this is, uh, and, but then being forced to actually live it for three years. So like, it's yeah. like, okay, you could bitch and you can piss and moan for three years, or, you know, you can embrace this different culture, this different way of living. And I was like, oh yeah, I lived it. Like I, by the end of the two, the three years I was, you know, I lived it. I was eating the food. I learned how to, you know, drink with these people, big drinkers <laughs> down there. Yeah. You know, I learned going to the bars, you could still smoke inside a lot of mm -hmm. places in that small town, which was great. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. Cigars or cigarettes. They would just let you, so every once in a while you see an old guy with a pipe, but you know. Nice. And then when you went to Vegas, how, how are you digging Vegas? Uh, I love Vegas. Yeah. I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. Uh, it's always a weird, you know, when people ask you, they're like, so you live in Vegas? Like, they're like, oh, do you live in a casino? It's like, well, no. Like, uh, I always get frustrated, especially I've been here long enough that I can call myself a local. I feel like mm -hmm. it's been like four years. Uh and it's always weird when you see people writing like pieces on Vegas. They're like the real Vegas. And they just like write about like four blocks downtown or whatever. And I'm like, no, this is a sprawling metropolis of suburbs where like people that work wait staff jobs for 25 years retire with pensions, you know, making yeah. six figures. Like it's a very weird city. And, you know, for creativity, that's fucking great. Like I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a lot a, of characters? Is there a scene out there? Like small scene lit scene small, kind of thing small scene i know uh walter kern and uh his wife amanda fortini uh they just moved out here and i think his wife has been at unlv has the black mountain institute but again mm -hmm. it's a little bit you know slanted academic uh but they're great you know they're very cool and very willing to uh, help writers and like go to readings and and support it's like some small bookstores in the downtown area and stuff and there's actually a rare books world here too i guess just because there's so much money coming in and out of the city all the time oh, shit. yeah uh yeah you wouldn't think vegas right like there's like a new york office a as, London as office, soon as you say vegas, that it, it yeah. totally makes sense but like <laughs> yeah. when you when you're first like hell yeah i would never think oh i'm gonna go shopping for rare books in fucking vegas right but yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of fucking sense dude i don't know oh, how shit. it happened but yeah yeah, it's people go to Vegas and when they're there, it's like partying with money is part of the deal, you know, so it, it makes a lot of sense. I just never would have thought that. Well, and just the clientele, like you have people that come through here, like even just the international tourists, like I think yeah. something over 50 million people visit this city a year Fuck. and like all over the world so you have like you know chinese billionaires or something coming in and just dropping like hundreds of thousands of dollars on mm -hmm. wine or something and you're like oh my yeah. god like i didn't know people were that rich like oh jesus christ like i might drop fucking what like 9.99 on a bottle that lasts <laughs> me two days <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or a nice box and hell uh, night you know hell yeah dude so how like how did you start the podcast what made you want to do it like how did that come about uh Maybe well for me it was it. mainly frustration like just kind of uh i was looking around especially coming out of like you know the mfa world and being kind of forced into that uh i was just looking around being like feeling suffocated like 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 is anybody going to say like how stupid everything is like, like, you know, there's this obsession with even like censorship and stuff that's become very commonplace with literature. You know, people are saying they're going to get hurt from books or something. Uh, and I just looking around going, is anyone going to say like how crazy this is? Like, I feel like, it, like, am I the only one? And I just feel like the only way I could do that was just do an outlet, like just mm -hmm. start a fucking podcast and just say what I was thinking. And, you know, a couple people, I don't have a huge audience, but a couple people like yourself found it and were like, hey, like, you know, I think this too. I'm like, yeah, you know, like I'm not the only one, right? Like, 
And even beyond that, like, if we're talking career angles, trying to actually be a writer, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's a DIY world. You have to have mm -hmm. something that you're selling other than just your books or your writing. You have to be writing a column every week, or you have to be a, running a press or a podcast or mm -hmm. something that's putting your, your name and face out there. So people, I mean, so people even pretend to buy the book or pretend to read it, you know, like which happens a lot. You know? Well, that's that's an interesting thing cuz you, like you've said something I'm trying to remember. Do I have it written down here? Um it wasn't necessarily the same thing like that. But from what you said, like I think um the world of critics and all that shit is like dead because like most people get their critiques of stuff or like um recommendations from stuff from whoever they follow on instagram or on twitter <laughs> you know it's like and then like the whole rotten tomatoes world where it's like these people like this stuff and that whole thing to me seems to have put the art of a critic like out in the trash like there's no purpose for them in this modern world like what do you think about that uh i think you're right i think we have almost zero critics uh and then if you're going you know there's still some movie critics there's still some other art critics but not really in literature you know who's doing books mm -hmm. when ao scott or whatever the new york times just said oh i'm gonna stop doing movies i'm gonna go do books only i'm like yeah good luck dude like <laughs> Uh, and he, you know, he did it because he was, I think it was kind of a cop out what he did with Dayo Scott re resigning from reviewing movies because, you know, people yelled at him online when he reviewed a Marvel movie or something negatively. I was like, I have a little balls, you know, in today's world with social media, it changed everything. Like it changed everything. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to tell you what they think right away in real time. They get to uh, ad hominem in real time. They get to like make fun of your appearance. You know, they get to do whatever they want, right, in real yeah. time. And that means that you got to fucking have some balls <laughs> if you're going to be a critic now because people are going to come after you. Yeah, for uh, real. No matter what you say, no matter what, whether you praise something or you, or you critique something. So there's that. And then there's the cultural importance, I think, especially literature, right? Like books used to be fucking cool, man. Like, you know, like even when I was growing up, I'm not that fucking old. Like I grew up nineties, early two thousands. Like if you hadn't read like the latest cool, hot book, like you were a loser, man. Like what were you doing? You know, like you didn't go pick it up and read it. Like, you know, a Jonathan Franzen's latest book, or you didn't go pick up, you know, uh, you know, whatever it was, even further back, you didn't read Capote's latest. Like, what are you, dude? You live under a rock, you know? And that's just not the case anymore. Cause like you said, it's just this constant feed in front of people's faces. And it's almost like robotic where they just repeat what they've heard from it yeah. without even having read or seen or, mm -hmm. you know, done anything engaged with the art in any way. Like, so I think that that's part of it too. Like I, I had to start this podcast because what I was seeing with things like that, yeah. Uh, I'm like, no, engage with it. You know, don't don't write it off. Don't say, oh, you don't have to read this writer because you know they're a bad person or something like that, or some other you know post hoc rationalization as to why you don't have to engage with this art. You know, fairly, and it's, it's all bullshit. You know. Yeah. Last night, um, I binged like three or four of your episodes, and uh you and sophie were talking about um the new critics in one of them and oh, um yeah. like are you a fan of that whole idea like the death of the author and the whole thing uh yes i would say i would call myself in the vein of the new critics kind of a radical formalist in terms of i think what ultimately matters uh and what actually gets us to some type of deep you know meaningful understanding is the piece of art right in front of you you know yeah. we can talk about biography we can talk about um you know larger socioeconomic or political trends or literary trends we can talk about all that but i think what really matters is what's on the page you know right in front of you right now whether it's a poem from you know 500 years ago or it's a poem mm -hmm. that was published yesterday what matters is that little thing on the page 
you know, there's a place for biography and all that. And I think people are interested in authors' biographies because they're usually not good people or like, uh, you know, <laughs> have some type of tragedy in their life and yeah, everybody latches on to that little tragedy and is saying, oh, this is why they wrote about this thing. And I just, I have a hard time buying that, you know? So I yeah. would call myself kind of a radical formalist, but the other side of the new critics, right? The kind of expansion of it with like, you know, all the different uh, theories that come in, you know, it's all made up is what I think. <laughs> like, you know, forced <laughs> frameworks that it's just funny because like yeah. I, I was writing notes on a bunch of stuff you guys were talking about and I like I'm not going to be like I'm not going to sugarcoat this I was drunk as shit listening to your guys' <laughs> stuff and um, so my, note, yeah. my notes don't really make a whole lot of sense here but like the thing that hit me last night was that the new critics like want the death of the author but in making the new critics like the whole thing behind it it makes that kind of an art form to critique but at the same point like if you want the death of the author like do you want the death of the author critic as well because it seems like you don't want that because you want everyone to want to come see what um jimbo bob says about this because jimbo bob's opinion is better than everyone else's opinion and I was just like, oh, my God, this is like some weird fucking paradox with the and I was like kind of blown away, like at three o'clock in the morning, like a douchebag. But that's just it. I never thought of it like that because I've argued about criticism being an art. Like I, I I'm like, I don't know if that's the case, but I've had people argue me that it is an art and listening to you guys talk about it. I can see where the art form would come from it, although a lot of that is like a trained art form. So I, I don't know where the question is there, but I just kind of went off my notes right there and it was a mess. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right that there is, there's an art to so many things, you know, people say that, you know, uh, there's an art to being a good salesman. I mean, there's an art to being a good cook, you know, baker, mm -hmm. um, you know, winemaker, beer maker. Like, there's all these kinds of like artisan crafts that take a lot of skill, finesse, you know. And I think what we tend to forget is that those are uh, difficult. Like that you have to be trained into those. You know, you can't just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to make wine especially if you go like the really good regions out there, like France, these people, they're 16th, 17th, 18th generation that have mm -hmm. been making these, the same wine over and over again every day, yeah. you know? And they didn't just grow into that. It's uh, school helps, school helps to discipline you. But I think all these things, writing or being a critic requires the discipline, the kind of somebody needs to teach you you need like almost like an apprenticeship you know back in the day when you were a sculptor or a painter you apprenticed and you started when you were you know 12 13 whatever and you spent 10 15 years just learning from this person that was better than you at the craft and showing you techniques little little skills or even just little things you can cheat on you know you could be able to cut that corner here you don't have to worry about that or yeah but yeah and then you talk about critics i mean the art form like actual writers have been filling the void of critics you know do we have a pauline kale do we have you know uh another harold bloom like is there anybody out there filling those voids i don't think so you know so what's the difference then between somebody just liking something because they like something and then somebody liking something because of a, a critical look at it an interesting question i think there's two things that aren't entirely separate but then they also are separate right so there's the the actual reaction that we have to reading something whether that be a critically acclaimed or not right mm -hmm. you know one of the first things that got me really into poetry i know you've mentioned this on your podcast before bukowski and mm -hmm. poets like that who the academy hates bukowski you know like they really don't include him in any of the anthologies or anything like that they try yeah. to avoid it being trained later in my life i'd understand why they don't mm. but then there's still that part of me that's just yeah but he's hitting that something inside of me like it hits that sweet spot for me where like like this is it you can't say it's bad you can say it's technically insufficient or something yeah uh 
So I think if we get too focused on one of those things or the other, like the kind of technical proficiency or the kind of just visceral reaction that like a piece of writing or art gives you, mm -hmm. if we focus on one of those too much, you're never going to get the full picture. So I guess I try to stress this kind of like balancing the two so that one isn't way down the other one. Yeah, And that I think does help me see a little clearer. Whereas yeah. it's like, it's more than just the technical proficiency. There's, there's something visceral, like there's a human, we, we can't even articulate it most of the time. Like it's so hard to grasp why we like something. Mm -hmm. So I do try to emphasize this, like your personal feeling about, you know, a piece of writing or a poem that you enjoy counts for so much more than technical proficiency. Yeah. But that a technical proficiency still does matter. You know, <laughs> like there are yeah. some rules and form to this and, if you can work both to perfection, you know, that's everything you could ask for. Yeah, I was thinking about it and I'm like, okay, so every, cause like being a critic isn't something that like your dad was a critic. So now you have to be a critic <laughs> and you're like, oh God damn it. I have to do the family business. Like most people get into it because they had those just gut reactions to things and they loved art and they're like, oh man, I really want to love this harder that was that was just always the thing where i'm like okay so there was a time when just having those gut reactions was enough for these people and then they said you know what no i want more like there has to be like a deeper understanding of stuff and so i'm i was just trying to like and again last night i'm trying to philosophize this whole thing i'm like okay so what happened what is the thing that makes that person go from this isn't enough to just like have it like touch my soul like i want to dissect a brain like what is the the crossing point for that because like a lot of people will go oh well they're just failed writers and so now <laughs> they have to critique and i'm like there's got to be something more than that though you know yeah it's i mean it's interesting for me and i think you this is what you were getting at like there is like i have to there's like mm -hmm. a personality trait i guess you could say even where like i yeah. can't not say what I'm thinking, even if it <laughs> is a disaster at a, you know, a cocktail party or something. Okay, like, oh, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> no, I, I get can't that. Not, I get that. Like, I just feel, and then when I, and when I do try to like, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this, it's just going to piss everybody off. And I feel like we're going to get a set of balls, dude. You know, like what mm -hmm. are these people are going to be upset about me saying like, okay, you know, what can I do? I can't help it. There's that compulsion, but I think there's, do you ever read Pauline Kael? And I know she's like a movie critic and not really like a, poetry critic no just, no her stuff there's such joy in it like her writings she's very harsh on like the movies and stuff but mm -hmm. you can tell she loves it like she absolutely loves the craft the art she wants these movies to be great right like and it, like it's just and you can feel that as you read there's like a pleasure to it there isn't like this scoldy atmosphere to it this kind is, of is she the one who wrote the essay about the importance of crap movies yeah yeah the trash art uh, yeah the trash yeah, art yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah okay yeah yeah. yeah yeah okay i'm familiar with that yeah she's fantastic and she didn't give a fuck you know <laughs> like this mm -hmm. middle-aged lady in the, like the 60s or 70s 80s uh fantastic but you know i just yeah and i think of harold bloom too like when you read his stuff and you know that's mm -hmm. high-minded that's very rigorous some of that his close yeah, readings yeah. are sometimes hard to read they're so academic but there's also like just a pure pleasure you get out of it. Like he clearly loves this and like he is almost charming when you're reading it. And I don't know if I'm as charming as those people, but you know, there's something to, I find it fun. Like I love talking about books. I love talking about art, movies, music mm -hmm. with somebody else who cares. Like I care yeah. about this stuff. Like I care about it a lot. So when I find somebody that does care, I'm like, hell yeah, let's hang out. Let's talk about this. I'll give you a phone call. What did you think of this? You know, did you read this? Like, I don't know. You I know what? Love... That that's good. Cause like, like I, I'm the same way. And like, like, like you, I have very strong opinions about certain things and that's fine, whatever. But I did notice something that I, I saw you two do on the show, but I've seen other people do it, but it never came up be until like, I saw you guys do it where there's some things you guys will talk about. And if you guys could both agree that something is shit, it's shit. And you guys will talk, <laughs> oh, that's shit, that's shit. But like if Sophie likes something and you thought it was crap, instead of saying it's shit, you would then say, well, I didn't like that. 
Yeah. So there's this whole thing where it's like um, the schoolyard mentality. Like if everyone agrees, then this is like shit. But if one person <laughs> likes it, then like it goes up a notch to where I just didn't care for it. What's that about? I guess I if I would take a stab at as to why I would say, you know, it's we're humans, you know, we're social animals, despite the fact that we like, you know, yeah, we can write poetry and stuff like that. There is this kind of, you know, sometimes they call it reading the room where like uh, if you're, you know, how harsh do you want to be? Right. Can, can you still get across your your disagreements with it without being, you know, an asshole or making the person, you know, especially a friend of yours or something that you like talking art with make them feel bad or 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 inferior and so you know you just don't want to make people feel like i don't know and then there's the trend aspect right like when you talk about like there are books you can read that have been regarded by the academy or or former critics you know the milieu if you will that are supposed to be great and then you read them and you're like "Ah, i don't know like i didn't really like it that's just what i was gonna ask you about that's so funny there's trend i mean it's just and we're humans, so we just fall victim to that trend. Like I, everybody starts to, you know, everybody thinks Dennis Johnson is fucking great. I mean, I've read his stuff. I think it's okay. Like maybe it was really great in the nineties when he was big, you know, nobody was doing that before, but yeah. you know, 20, 35 years later, I didn't read it. I was like, you know, nine years old when his shit was coming out. So reading it now, I'm like, oh shit, is it really so good? It's almost kind of like, you know, I don't know, indulgent and selfish in some of these ways. At least I would call it that. I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, and is that just me naturally wanting to be a contrarian? I mean, I hope not. Like I, I try to be as honest as I can when I'm trying to engage with something. Yeah. I don't and I but it is just really hard. I mean, especially social media now that changes everything. So yeah. if a big influential book person or book talk, whatever it is, says this book is shit or this person you shouldn't you know, buy their books or whatever, that has a trickle down effect, you know, whether they're right or not, you know. Well, to give you credit, like, like, I've heard you say, like, you did not like this piece or whatever. But if then there's something in it that rings true, and is great, like, you'll give credit where fucking credit's due. So like, props on you for that. Because a lot of people would just be like, no, this is shit. I mean, they would say it more articulate than that. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, <laughs> I, I I'm. It means a lot that people recognize that because I I do try to, and this is what you know. You and I chatted via email about this with Ginsburg and kind mm-hmm. of Ginsburg's a lot of love hate, especially when you go into like the academy. Although he's yeah. very well canonized, like if he's in all of the you know what we would call the Western or American Western literature canon, you know. When do you think that happened? Like, when do you uh, think he was embraced? I don't know. Uh, I think there was some embrace embracing right away um, by a small group, right? The larger yeah. group clearly didn't like him, particularly the Academy didn't like him. Uh, he dropped out of the Academy. You know, he never mm-hmm. really, <clears throat> he was kind of anti-academic in a way. I think the getting, getting his book banned right away, like mm-hmm. right upon publication helped you know that made yeah. people curious he is i think i talked about this on that episode where he, he's accessible mm-hmm. um even though he is very technically proficient like if you read his stuff like it is people are like, oh it's free verse mm, you know just like bloom would say about whitman there's nothing free about whitman's free verse like it is very carefully same mm-hmm. thing with ginsburg you know it is very carefully laid out rhythmic almost the way he has it going in these, you know, so I think that helped the fact that the work was actually really good and not just flavor of the week kind of helped uh, his reputation, getting it banned. And then I think throughout the last, you know, since that book came out the last 70, 80 years, there's been various trends in the culture where like the beats will get a revival and people because it is cool like you know i'm not a huge beat guy but like it is fucking cool like these guys just kind of lived on the earth you know like kind of nomads wandering wrote Mm. these kind of long winding diary style kind of the first auto fiction Mm. style writing and i mean that's cool like who the fuck is doing that you know like who's doing that now like was Wukowski the last one like Uh, the thing that cracks me up with auto fiction is when and like I've heard Ben Lerner do it and I've heard Ocean Vong do it where 
the book is like obviously completely about their life but they try to like say it's not like it just like the main character just happens to be a Vietnamese immigrant who lives in Connecticut you know <laughs> just like me like it's but it's not like necessarily me and like they do all this dancing around and it's like Jesus fucking Christ that is you like just yeah. own it like what the fuck man uh, but yeah, well, like the thing with Ginsburg too, I think Ginsburg was probably the best self promoter on the fucking planet when it comes oh, yeah. to a poet. Like if there was anything going on that he could like work into poetry, he would like be on the news. Like, let me come in and speak right. to like, he was just like the talking head. You know I what I'm saying? He's the most influential. I think he's the most influential poet of the 20th century. As, you said it yeah. on that episode too. And when I was a kid, like the first poet, like if I had to guess what a poet looked like, it would be Allen Ginsberg because I saw him on the TV all the time. And he would be on some like news show and my parents would go, oh God, this guy again. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my parents don't like him. What's he got to say? Let me like, yeah. let me get closer. Like, what was that? Right. Um, so like that was just like um like I it's like I like the mythos of Ginsburg way more than I like his work. You know, like I like right. what he did for poetry more than I like his work. Like I do like a lot of his stuff, but as a whole, like I'm not a fan. And as his work went on, um some of his stuff was just like not for me. Like I'm yeah. not saying it's bad, it just I am obviously not the audience for this. You didn't. You, you know? didn't like Sphincter, his poem uh, <laughs> about his asshole. Actually, age, that right? I do like. Yeah. Um, but like, what was it? Um, what I think that was right before he died. It came out that Sphincter. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. The Plutonium Ode book. Yeah. Um, that one, I was just like, "What the fuck is happening here?" <laughs> like, it just didn't. I think that's the book. <laughs> Because I think I liked reality sandwiches. I'm trying to like remember what order I read these in. But yeah, some of them like, you know, but that's how it is with pretty much everybody. And it's funny you brought that up too. Um, we're going on so many different topics here. I, I was thinking Rome, yeah. I, I was thinking the other day, like, do poets get better right before they die? Like, I feel like there are some poets who, when they know death is near they have like a different lens they see everything through and um but then you're like so yeah sphincter came out right before he died I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so i was trying to think if there if there's any like examples i could pull from to i see. think it it depends right like it it does depend on the person and it depends on kind of their health i think too towards the end mm -hmm. of their life you know, like famously Shakespeare didn't write anything in the last four years of his life, whatever. Uh, Bloom has a great theory. He was, like, he was probably ill, right? He had syphilis, right? He was, yeah. you know, all these people were dying of STDs that we can easily prevent now. But like, um, it's interesting. I actually have an episode coming out this weekend that I've been editing that's about Charles Simic. And it's one of his most recent books that I thought was awful. But, you know, he's released great books, too. Like, his yeah. 1989, you know, Pulitzer winner, The World Doesn't mm -hmm. End, is fucking great. But then this one he released in 2017, he's kind of dying out a little bit, like, kind of fading away. So, I don't know. I mean, I think there is something to to writers getting better as they age. Of course, like, I'm thinking Yates is probably the most famous example, right? And mm -hmm. he did go a little bit crazy, too, towards the end, you know. Literally, he went a little insane with the kind of um, seance shit that was happening, you know, yeah. <laughs> through all the world at that time, where he would like literally call, they would hold these seances and he and his wife and they would like bang on the table and he would just write, you know, free verse, stream of consciousness, unedited and say it was the word of God and just like put it out there. So he was losing his mind a little bit, yeah. but then he wrote some great shit like, you know, <laughs> sailing to Byzantium or something like. Uh, and then you have somebody like Simic who falls off or even Ginsburg. I think Ginsburg's best work was his first book, right? Mm -hmm. Like how was his best work? And then he did kind of live off that reputation, which is, I mean, well-earned, right? You only need one. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, but then I think of somebody like this is not poetry, but uh, Howard Ashman, the uh, you know the songwriter. Uh, folks that don't know, uh, he was Disney's songwriter in the kind of Disney revival in the '90s. So he literally, you know, got diagnosed with AIDS, and then the last two years of his life, he wrote like three masterpieces in a row. He did Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin, and he wrote all those songs. Like mm -hmm. the last two years of his life, then died, you know, a horrific death from AIDS or whatever. And I'm just like, there's an example of a guy who just got better until the, literally the day he died. Yeah. Apparently like Prince Ali and like Aladdin, he was like on the phone in the hospital bed, like barely able to speak, you know, about to die, like talking about changes to it and what they should do. And look at it, look at it now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those are some masterpieces. Isn't that, musicals, but yeah. Isn't that how um, fucking Beethoven went? Yeah. For, yeah. Like trying to remember i mean that's probably totally fictionalized by this point but yeah the trend the romanticizing these great artists too yeah. ginsburg's one of them where you know there's nothing wrong with that i think that's that's cool when they start to become bigger than life you know yeah. like bigger than just a human being who was just trying to write some poetry you know he became this huge cultural symbol he was influencing music you know those famous yeah. pictures with him and bob dylan and ginsburg with that beard and the crazy hair you know yeah, for the, real. he was fat then you know he's a little older like and it's weird awesome. when i see yeah. when i see pictures of him when he was young yeah. like i'm like who the fuck's that guy that's not yeah. fucking ginsburg get that fucking guy out of here um no but like uh like kerouac is someone who i've just never gotten into i've tried Same, so yeah. fucking hard and I just can't fucking do it. Now, you were saying you think when people say everything's been done, that that's bullshit. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about those thoughts real quick? Uh, for me, and, you know, because I was, I remember being in grad school and being like, like, ah, you know, what if I'm trying to do something different, blah, blah. And then people would be like, well, everything's been done before. Who cares? And I just, mm. I felt, one, I didn't believe it. Like, I couldn't tell myself oh, everything's been done before, so it doesn't matter. It's, yeah. I think it's a very small-minded way. Mm -hmm. And I'll, not only is it small-minded way of thinking, I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you believe yeah. that everything's been done before, well, then how are you ever going to reach beyond the kind of you know realm of the known or the limitations of the known? Yeah. And there are limits, right? Like we're talking about words. Words can only do so much. And you see artists, particularly poets, uh, really bump up against those limits where you're that's the whole point of the art is how far can you go mm -hmm. with this kind of limiting framework of just words you know yeah. I some 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 like Shakespeare and others just invent fucking words buryment and just invent fucking words uh, and that's awesome and they weren't sitting there thinking oh it's all been done before I can't invent a new word it's like yeah I fucking can <laughs> like no it like not everything is like how could we ever say that like we discover new things every day and every yeah. time, you know, Kale writes about this where everyone's like, oh, these are the rules for movie making until somebody breaks them and it's great. And we're like, yeah. oh, now nah, the rules have changed. Like it's, you should be going for that. I'm not saying you'll achieve it every time. It's really hard, you know, <laughs> to achieve it every time. But yeah, that's, I just, there is this kind of death like attitude around literature in general right now. And I get it. The sales are down. I get it. It's not as culturally important. I get it. It's harder than ever to get your book into like, uh, into people's hands and, and make them notice you and, and mm -hmm. seriously consider it. But like, I just feel like if we have that attitude that it's already over, that everything's already been yeah. done before we even step foot. Like I wasn't fucking born until like the nineties, bro. Like mm -hmm. fuck all that shit that came before me. I don't care. You know, like, I, I mean, I want to absorb it, but I want to take yeah. it to the next level. And I think Bloom says this in his in very eloquently, a lot of essays where he says, there's a fear a lot of writers have where they think, Oh, that's been done before. Or, you know, Shakespeare did it better than me. And that could be true when you're starting out, right? Because we're not that good. We're just starting. We're, we're trying things. We don't know exactly. But then he says, but actually there is everything to be thought and said, if you have an original idea, an original thinking process, an original yeah. voice, you can do anything. You know, sky is the limit. This is yeah. the beauty of art. This is why we love art. Like this is why we are so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah that's just... that's that's kind of what I was leaning on too. Like, because everyone 
the only thing unique that we all have is like our perception and our upbringing you know like how our minds were molded and how we visualize things. Like if you had five people watch a car accident, they would give you five different stories of how it happened. You right. know what I'm saying? Um, but like that whole thing, like um, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, that's like fucking Ecclesiastes, you know, yeah. like motherfuckers have been saying that everything's been done way the fuck back then, dude. And um, so like when you were talking right now, I was thinking, because I listened to it last night, I'm like, oh yeah, um, the watermelon emoji in a poem. That's new. Like, we should lean <laughs> into that. <laughs> the Lana Del Rey uh, yeah, yeah. emojis. Yeah. The thing is, I emojis could work in a mm -hmm. poem. You know, they could. Yeah. Uh, they just don't. <laughs> when you say the fruit and then have the same image of it, it doesn't, you know, it's a repetitive, but which also could be a technique, but, you know, not in that one at least. But yeah, you well, just that, repeat, that's, repeat those lines, you know? And, and like, why like, does it? <laughs> Why do celebrities want to get into the poetry game? I don't think they, celebrities want to get into the poetry world. I think celebrities, agents, and managers want to make more money. And that, book companies want to make more money. And like, yeah. I'm like, there's a part of me that thinks, like, I mean, I can't fucking speak for Lana Del Rey, but like, the thing <laughs> is, is like, I'm assuming, like, oh, it's COVID. This bitch can't tour. Um, how am I going to make any money off of her this year? Oh, hey, you want to fucking write a book? Well, I like poetry. Hold my beer. I'll be right back. Let yeah. me get on the phone with my good friend Simon over here and his buddy Schuster and their friend Amperstand. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I think there was a time, especially like when we're talking about like the beats and stuff and you like you brought up Jim Morrison and Leonard Cohen and fucking Bob Dylan where putting out a book of poetry was like kind of like a cool like let me do this and be in your club you know for um at least like the rock star group you know um but now i think it's just like how the fuck can we make a couple bucks here and the well, i mean like because here here's the thing like and this is probably where we're gonna disagree like i'm not gonna fucking say anything isn't a poem but I'm not going to fucking sit here and say everything's great. Like, there's a lot of shit that I don't like, but that's like subjective fucking art. Like, I don't have to fucking like everything because not everything's made for me. The shit I write isn't fucking made for everybody. And a lot of people aren't going to like it. And that's fucking fine. But when I, I can't remember when this was, dude, but like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go check out like what's happening in poetry at barnes and noble you know i'm gonna hit the end cap and i'm gonna fucking that's a look. rough that's a yeah. rough one. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like all insta poets yeah and i was and i'm like and some of the artwork on the covers were cool and like i'm very minimalistic so i dig that kind of shit and i'm like oh this looks great and there was this guy rh sin who when i first read his stuff i thought was a <laughs> like 15 year old white girl you know <laughs> and it turns out he's a um adult african-american fourth wave feminist or something like that you know <laughs> right. and but like his like covers and his titles were so amazing i'm like oh i'm gonna eat all this up and i open this shit up and i'm like what the fuck is this like this <laughs> is not for me you know but like like you guys were saying on the lana del rey episode like sophie was going you know, like when I was 16 or when I was 18, I would have loved this book. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's enough to legitimize that for being a fucking thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. We're going to cut it there. That's my talk with Andrew Whitstead from Heavy Board. And we are going to be heavier border um, on the next episode where he comes on. Um, it was awesome talking to him, and I'm going to be on his show. We're recording that on Thursday, so that's going to be a whole lot of fun. He could grill me now the way I grilled him. Uh, he was a great sport. I didn't mean for any of the things I asked him to be like gotcha questions or anything like that, but as I was editing this, I'm like, oh, that, that came off a bit gotcha-y, but he handled it with great aplomb and um, handled himself very well so andrew thank you again and if you guys haven't subscribed to his show yet it's wherever podcasts can be found um just type in heavy board and if you're on youtube you can find him on youtube so if you like this podcast episode if you dug this go ahead and break them thumbs 
crack them open. And uh, make sure to subscribe. Um, as far as the butt plugs go, fuck it. Let's do some butt plugs here. Okay, so let's start with the shout outs here. I want to give a big thank you to all you motherfuckers over on Patreon. I want to give a thank you to Michael, to Cedar, to Harry over there in the YouTube thank you crew. I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia. You guys are awesome. And then for the big swinging dicks over there in the Anarchy Crew, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Shaylin, to Tim G, to Chill Baby, to Tamara, to Adam, to Chase, to JH, and to Jessica. You guys are fucking awesome. And then for the biggest of all thank yous, it goes over there to the number one chappy over there in the Chat Book of the Month Club. Caitlin! Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. And it's people like you who make doing things like this worth a damn. Make sure to go out and get Bloodshed Review Issue 2 with Mindy Simmonson and Blood Rag Poet of the Year Bunny Wild and Blood Rag Poet of the Year runner-up Rich Boucher. Holy shit. This is a unstoppable issue. Go ahead and pick up the Blood Rag Issue 13, our year anniversary issue. Give that a gander. Take a look at it. Go get the stuff. And I think my new chapbook, Drinking Less, is out now. Is it out this week or next week? Oh, I think it's next week, so never mind. Project Broadside's out now as well, as far as new releases go. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind you of winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry. Pick it up like it's hot. Keep buying our books. Support Poetic Anarchy Press. Type hard, everybody. Join the Anarchy Crew, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.